showing you a snippet of State's Exhibit 18, which Mr. Binger spent three or four minutes showing that Mr. Rosenbaum wasn't around. And my client couldn't know that he wraps his head in orange. Chain, bag, orange. Ladies and gentlemen, we had this video almost as long as they've had this video. But Mr. Binger will use this video to lie to your faces and tell you that Kyle Rittenhouse was taking advantage of the situation. I object, Your Honor. It's in the picture. Um, it's argument. Ladies and gentlemen, this case is not a game. It is my client's life. We don't play fast and loose with the facts, pretending that Mr. Rosenbaum was citizen A number one guy. He was a bad man. He was there. He was causing trouble. He was a rioter. And my client had to deal with him that night alone. When I say that the truth matters and this is not a game, what do I mean by that? Mr. Binger is the one who put on the Kenderi brothers. The reason he put them on, in spite of what he might say today, is because he wanted you, now 18, soon to be 12 people, to say, gosh, that kid just went to that place and just protected it. He wasn't asked. He was asked. Mr. Kenderi's asked Nick. Nick got a group of people to go down there. The people from West Bend came. Provocation, another thing. Think back to back on November 2nd when this case started. Did you hear one word out of Mr. Binger's mouth about provocation? You didn't because it was never said. But when his case explodes in his face, now he comes out with provocation. That was opening. And most importantly, in opening, quoting from Mr. Bigger's first paragraph of his opening statement on November 2nd, 2021. This occurred after the defendant chased down Mr. Rosenbaum and confronted him while yielding an AR-14. Ladies and gentlemen, you've seen the videos. Mr. Rosenbaum sees, and I'll show you the video in my closing argument. You'll see Mr. Rosenbaum take off when he sees my client coming along with the Zeminskis to set up the ambush of my client. Provocation? I don't think so. The things that I've just pointed out to you, why is that a problem? Because one, he's lying. Two, he's misrepresenting. Or he wasn't prepared when he started this trial and his closing argument has been a change to try and fit what has come out. Remember how when he was talking, there's no proof that the Rosenbaums, excuse me, Rosenbaum and Zeminski knew each other? Maybe they didn't know each other that night, but they were together throughout the night. You see them together in pictures wreaking havoc in this city. And now we have the magic pixel camera that brings forth his provocation. I'm going to go through the charges and we'll talk about each one of them. Then I'll go through the witnesses and hopefully I'll bring it home in an honest and forthright fashion. Here. Count one. Reckless homicide. My client shot Joseph Rosenbaum. Ladies and gentlemen, Make no mistake, there was nothing reckless about my client's conduct that day in regards to Mr. Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum was coming at him. My client ran from him, retreated, which is not needed, continues to run. The plastic bag is thrown, the metallic plastic bag. Kyle doesn't know what it is at that time. It causes him to turn and look over his shoulder, pointing the gun in that direction. Mr. Rosenbaum, is he dissuaded by that? No, he is not. He continues running and advancing on my client. That whole time, 
The state doesn't say anything about Mr. Zeminski firing the shot. Mr. Zeminski having his gun out. Think of the circumstances as they existed at 11.50 on August 20th, excuse me, August 25th of 2020. He runs through that parking lot. He continues running on. He turns as he comes into that box canyon with the cars, the van, and I believe it's a Pepsi machine. And he turns because he has no place else to go. I'll show you the Zanin video later on. What's important about the Zanin video, you see that mob of people destroying the cars at Car Source 3, which Mr. Binger doesn't want my client to go and try to protect, even though he was asked by those individuals to protect that property. Nick Smith called him, hey, they're bashing up the cars and starting fires. Go down there. He goes down there. He has as much right to go there as anybody else in the city of Kenosha and be unmolested by the likes of Joseph Rosenbaum, Kelly, and Joshua Zeminski. And Mr. Binger says, oh, we'll get the Zeminskis later. Well, ladies and gentlemen, last time I checked, this is still United States of America, and he has the burden of proof. If he wants you guys to believe that my client pointed a gun at him, call the Zeminskis put him on the witness stand, ask him questions, and let me or Mr. Sharafasi cross-examine him. That's how we do things in a court of law, but not in Mr. Binger's court. He says, I'm blaming the victim. As a defense lawyer, I might get accused of that more than some other people. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rosenbaum was shot because he was chasing my client and going to kill him, take his gun, and carry out the threats he made. And Mr. Binger wants to make a big hubaloo about the shot in the back. Remember his opening statement, he shot him in the back. And that's why I'm sitting here in front of the jury, like this. Did he shoot him here? Did he shoot him there? Because of the way the bullet went in, and where the bullet ended up in the hip, you know full well that the individual, and I asked the doctor, is on a horizontal plane. What is that horizontal plane consistent of? Somebody leaping, lunging at my client. And we know how close Mr. Rosenbaum was to my client. The furthest he could have been when it started, the first shot, four feet with the stipend. We know that his hand was on the gun. Mr. Binger wants you to believe that that was just happenstance and accident. Come on, people. Physical evidence does not lie. Use your common sense and good judgment. He talks about Mr. Rosenbaum just somehow ending up down at the riots. Remember that? Mr. Rosenbaum, according to the testimony, walked from the bus center, four miles out to Ms. Swartz's house, and then he couldn't stay there for some reason, and four miles all the way back. That's not just ending up. That's going someplace with a purpose, and throughout the night you saw his purpose. And there was more than one piece of testimony about Mr. Rosenbaum, whether it was a hospital, or whether or not it was a jail. Remember that? And there was testimony regarding his medication. Ms. Swartz said we couldn't get medication because the Walgreens were all boarded up. She said, the hospital said, they gave him his medication. So whatever facility gave him his medication, Mr. Binger, the man with the burden of proof, why didn't he bring in a hospital or a jail to prove that Mr. Rosenbaum was properly medicated? He'd been off his medications, according to Ms. Swart, for seven to 10 days. We know that he was acting like somebody who wasn't on their proper medication. He was not 
acting normal. Next. Richie Richard McGinnis. Reckless. And here, Mr. McGinnis would like to talk about, because the self-defense does not go to Mr. McGinnis, but if Kyle was privileged in exercising self-defense against Mr. Rosenbaum, it carries over to the endangering count of Mr. McGinnis. And Mr. McGinnis, specifically, if the defendant, and I'm reading directly from an instruction, page nine, second full paragraph, which you will be given, if the defendant was acting lawfully in self-defense, his conduct did not create an unreasonable risk to another. That is Mr. McGinnis. Ladies and gentlemen, when my client shot Joseph Rosenbaum, he feared for his life, he feared because of the prior threats, the prior statements, and the violent acts that had been witnessed by my client. Mr. McGinnis, as a witness, I think he helped us more than he hurt us. He talked about, and this was on cross for Mr. Binger, how do you know what Mr. Rosenbaum was thinking? Because I don't. Two, he got into a situation over his head, thinking, as he said before. He states Kyle did not know Richard, that he was there, meaning Richard McGinnis. He's a citizen journalist who was running along with his hand in his, his phone and his hand up in the air in to get a story. My client is not responsible for endangering him when he runs into danger. Plus, the instruction says that if he was privileged as to Rosenbaum, he's privileged as to count two, Mr. McGinnis. Count three, jump kick man. The uncomplaining, unidentified witness in count three. There will be some video later on when I'm going through some of that. You'll see, and I ask you to pay attention. The state has said he's not kicking him. He doesn't hit him. When you watch the video, and it'll be in slow motion, watch where his foot goes, watch what happens to Kyle's head. The force of him kicking him in the face spins his body 180 degrees around. And then it's on. Huber coming in from behind, hitting him in the neck with the skateboard. Ladies and gentlemen, what you see throughout event number two, and this is the beginning of it, is individuals working in a mob. The, they don't know what happened at Car Source 3, event number one. But somebody said, hey, he shot somebody. Doesn't know that he was being chased by a crazy person. But they're going to get their licks in on Kyle Rittenhouse, or, as they perceive him, somebody from the other side who has been putting out their fires, causing problems for their, for them, stopping them from wreaking havoc in Kenosha like they did the night before. And ladies and gentlemen, the standard is likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Great bodily harm is defined as likely to cause serious bodily injury. A kick to the head is likely to cause a serious injury. Did my client suffer a debilitating injury as a result of that? No, but that's not the standard. Mr. Huber, he's a rioter. 
pushing a dumpster lit on fire, going to the barricades to pick up pepper balls, throw them back, pointing his middle finger at the police. He's assisting Rosenbaum at the gas station, hits Rittenhouse two times with the skateboard, and attempts to disarm him. You'll see it all in the slow motion video later on. And Kyle Rittenhouse is running away from Anthony Huber. The state wants to call my client an active shooter. And the reason they want to do that is because of the loaded connotations of that word. Everyone has heard of the theater killings, the school shootings, and things like that. Ask yourself, the definition of an active shooter is somebody with a plan to inflict multiple casualties, usually out of anger or animus towards a group. This case, what caused Kyle Rittenhouse to shoot somebody? Joseph Rosenbaum. He runs after shooting Joseph Rosenbaum for almost two blocks before scene number two. Mr. Binger makes a big thing about Kyle Rittenhouse not staying around. Car source three after the shooting. Ladies and gentlemen, if Kyle Rittenhouse had stayed at car source three, all that would have happened is it would have made the police have an easier job because scene one and scene two would have been put in the same location. My client ran two blocks without shooting at anyone, pointing at anyone, doing anything to try and get away. He tells the individuals he's going to the police and he's running in that direction when he stopped. He's hitting the head with a hand with a rock in it, knocking his hat off. Mr. Binger says, oh, he just knocked his hat off. I don't think that individual was trying to steal Mr. Rittenhouse's hat. He was trying to take his head off. Who comes in next? Anthony Huber, for the first time. Hits him. Opening statement, Mr. Binger, was he takes a swing at him. Now it's he blocked because we took the videotape and lightened it up. Huber strikes him in the head and arm the first time. Jump kick man comes in, kicks him in the face, spins his body 180 degrees, and Anthony Huber comes in for the second lick to the shoulder neck area trying to take his head off. And when he does that, his other hand goes grabbing for the gun, his bare hand onto the gun and pulling it away from Kyle Rittenhouse. Mr. Binger wants Kyle to sit there and hope and pray to God his strap works and Anthony Huber can't get the gun. We don't know that, we'll never know that as he's running away from him. A shot as the gun is being separated from his body and you'll see the butt way far away when the shot is finally fired. Even Gage Grosquitz said he was concerned about the blows that Jump Kick Man and Anthony Huber were inflicting on Kyle's head. That's probably the only thing I agree with with Mr. Grosquitz. Gage Grosquitz. The state must prove beyond a reasonable that what Kyle did under those facts and circumstances was unreasonable, that he was not entitled to self-defense. Consider all the events that had occurred that evening, him being attacked, kicked in the head, hit in the head with a skateboard, other individuals running up on him, and now Mr. Grosquitz runs up on him. And the first action of Mr. Grosquitz, and I'll go through the video later, is really he's running in, the hand is coming up, and the gunshot with humor goes off. And the natural reaction is the flinch. He covers up. And then he pulls his hands up. And as he's standing with his hands up, look, he's not gripping the gun anymore in a pistol grip. Hands apart, hands up. And as he comes in to finish the job, the hand is on the gun going for Mr. Rittenhouse. And he says it's an involuntary movement. 
the shot comes before it gets directly to his head. But that motion is coming, the shot, and it continues on with that momentum. Enough momentum to go through the bullet and point directly at Kyle's head. Does Kyle fire again? No, he doesn't. Actions likely to cause death or great bodily harm. And he is coming in with a loaded Glock. And we asked Mr. Gro Gage Grosquitz about it. He wouldn't even admit that there was one in the chamber. That's why we had to put on the officer to talk about the unfired shell casing. Lakowski talked about clearing the weapon and a live round coming out. Because Grosquitz won't say anything that puts him in a bad light. Grosquitz, the person who has 10 million reasons to lie. And we all know he did lie because he never gave a new interview after giving his statement saying he dropped his gun going down the street. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the charges. Those are a synopsis of the charges. As I stated, the burden is on the state and they must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that my client did not have the right to self-defense. Kyle, as he sits here, is presumed innocent of all charges. If there is any reasonable hypothesis to reconcile with Kyle's innocence, that is what you are to choose. Remember when looking at the burden of proof. They have it. Think about some of the things, the shoddy investigation, the rush to judgment from the Kenosha District Attorney's Office, the Zeminskis not being called as witnesses. They have the burden of proof. We don't. They want it to be that Kyle was out there doing something improper. Kyle was a 17-year-old kid out there trying to help this community. He was asked to provide help in protecting property at the car sources. It started and he did it. He did provide aid and he was asking if anybody needed aid. Whether somebody chooses to accept that aid, that's on them. But Mr. Binger wants to poo-poo his sincere belief that he's helping people because he borrowed bandages from Dominic Black, and I think he might have borrowed something from Lakowski also. But in the picture, when the Kandiri poses with all the people who are gonna protect his property, there's Kyle's big orange gator box. He's got his pack on, filled with things, and he's willing to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle was not an active shooter. That is a buzzword that the state wants to lash onto because it excuses the actions of that mob on the 25th of 2020. Whenever Kyle was there, he reacted to people attacking him. There's numerous times, and you'll see him on the video, he does not shoot. He runs two blocks from 63rd to 61st scene two without firing his weapon. Individual hits him in the back of the head. He does not turn around to address that threat. Huber takes a swing at him with the skateboard like that. Kyle blocks and the skateboard's knocked out of his hand. He doesn't turn around and shoot him. He keeps running and falls from the two hits. He's run that far and yet somehow he just fell over on his own. As soon as he's on the ground, they're there attacking him. And you see the people the law of self-defense. You've seen it. You've heard it. Now I'm going to go through the witnesses. Oh. Dominic Black, first witness, charged by Mr. Binger for providing the gun to my client. Two counts, looking at up to six years in prison. His case has been adjourned so that he can help the state. I don't think he helped the state that much. 
I think he was a pretty truthful witness all in all. He told them about Kyle there to help people, that they had permission from the Kandiris, that he saw Kyle help the woman with the foot, help the person with the hand. Mr. Binger wants to just say, oh, that doesn't matter. If it wasn't Kyle, it would have been somebody else. The point is, he was there and he did it. There was no pointing by Kyle of any laser sight. There was no ability for Kyle or him to point laser sights at anyone because their guns didn't have the type of optics that did that. He said Kyle was there to help. The only person helping was Kyle. And he can say what he wants about whether or not he let Kyle take the gun or not take the gun. He never told him not to. He went to the location with him. They bought straps at Jelensky's together. He's trying to cover his butt a little bit. The guns were there and they took them. They took the guns, as he said, to deter people attacking them. He saw Kyle at the end, sweating, was in shock, and said that he shot someone, he had to do it. That is Dominic Black. Corey Washington saw the rioters breaking up concrete at the church parking lot, described Rosenbaum as erratic, stated the crowd was suspicious, I don't know what that means. One of the things that I thought was strange was they were the night before they were burning garbage trucks, but they only burnt the old ones. I think that tells you something about his point of view, that there's a certain amount of property damage that is justified and okay. Um, Kenosha was using those garbage trucks that the rioters lit on fire. And nothing regarding property destruction was going to do anything to help Jacob Blake. We also learned that Kyle Rittenhouse smokes cigarettes and that he has an affinity for the Dinosaur Museum. Detective Howard, ladies and gentlemen, Detective Howard's testimony and Detective Antaramian's testimony is the stuff of what reasonable doubt is made of. Two detectives, both lead officers on this case. They've sat through every minute of this trial and their opinions of the actions of Mr. Rosenbaum from testimony, videos, couldn't be more diametrically opposed. Detective Howard on cross-examination knew that the guy was hiding in the car and jumped out from behind the car and began chasing Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh boy. That's not good for the state's case. So there's the old chit chat between Mr. Howard and Mr. Antaramian and the prosecutors after. And all of a sudden we've come up with the new theory. And you heard the new theory that he raised the gun and that's what's on the video. Could I have the firearm please? Think about when Kyle Rittenhouse is firing the gun, when he's seen holding the gun throughout the events of the 25th. Shouldering the gun, and I'm not going to bring it all the way up to my shoulder, to the right, right shoulder, which would be a stance like this. The reason I objected in his closing argument is because that's not the way he was standing. If he's standing like this, this is right-handed, pointing the gun this way, 
up at the ready, his back would be to the drone footage. In the drone footage, you see the arm. It would be somebody having to hold the gun left-handed. This is a right-handed firearm. If this gun is brought up to his face and it is pulled back, the shell casing hot and the fire that ejects it is going to be going right into Kyle's face. The photograph I'll talk about later, you don't see the straps on his shirt. It didn't happen the way he said. It doesn't happen the way in the foot, in the photograph. I'm gonna need this again, but I'm gonna set it down. Burden of proof, once again. The telephones, the searching of telephones with search warrants, the subpoenaing of records. I have no problem with that. It's good police work. But when you pick and choose and you make favorites, it's not. My client testified, and the, I'll say it this way, the detective testified that my client's phone was sent to the FBI. It was unsearchable because of the operating system the FBI and the federal government had not cracked it yet. We found out about that. We had nothing to hide. Here, here's the numbers. Search the phone as long as we're given a simultaneous copy. So we have what you have. We can have our experts look at it. They can have their experts look at it. So we know that there isn't anything added or deleted. We did that. We gave that to the state. If we had something to hide, they never would have gotten in that phone. They took the phone, they made a copy, they searched it. Lo and behold, nothing of an incriminating nature in it, nothing militia, white supremacist, any of that. Gage Grosquitz, different story. They had a valid search warrant for it. The only search warrant that these guys have never not executed when it's sitting right in front of them. Not just that, but Mr. Grosquitz could have consented to them going in the phone. If he has nothing to hide, why not? Why not let them look in the phone? And let's take common sense and judgment one step further. Police officers get search warrants they execute the search warrant. Sometimes somebody feels as though their rights have been violated and it gets litigated in a court of law. If it was illegal, the information in that search warrant never comes out in court. If it's legal after a judge has said there were no rights violated, it comes in in evidence. What was Mr. Grosquitz afraid of? Why wouldn't the state execute the search warrant let Mr. Grosquitz and his attorney object, file a motion and say, you can't go in my phone. Let the judge decide, not the person who's prosecuting and protecting Mr. Grosquitz. Come on, people. Mr. Grosquitz has 10 million reasons for not wanting somebody to go in his phone. The timing with the detectives and some of their actions, I think are very important. They get down to Antioch at about 3.30 in the morning of the 26th, less than four hours after this happens. By six o'clock, 6.30, given the benefit of the doubt, Kyle Rittenhouse is under arrest for first degree murder. There's not been any autopsy done. There haven't been any witness statements taken. They've got two or three videos. The bullets, I should say it this way, all of the bullets have not even been picked up from car source at this point. But they're willing to make a decision. And were they under pressure? I'm sure they were. They're afraid that there's gonna be another night of looting. 
destruction in Kenosha because of this happening and the way the word got out. He traveled across state lines. He was here. He brought his AR with him. The AR was here. He was a white supremacist looking for trouble. Nothing, nothing. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, when we picked you guys as jurors, we asked you if you could decide based upon the evidence that happens in the courtroom. Not what you'd heard before, not all of the lies and untruths that have been put out in the media. I heard one guy say, my client discharged the gun 60 times. Ladies and gentlemen, what's happening in court is what you decide the truth on. He was charged on the 27th. Still, they didn't have the information, the autopsy's final, anything like that. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a rush to judgment. Richie McGinnis, I talked about earlier, citizens, citizen journalists. Mr. Binger talked about him seeing guns. But remember the cross of Mr. McGinnis. Guns are not legal in Portland, Washington, or D.C. or New York. They're not allowed on the streets. You can be arrested. There are state laws. And ladies and gentlemen, the gun in this case is no longer an issue. Whether or not it was a dangerous weapon as it applies to the charges is. But my client is no longer charged with minor in possession of a firearm. But he needs his AR-15 and the assault weapon and the fear that goes with that to try and bring home an unjust guilty verdict. Ryan Balch. Ryan Balch had never met Kyle Rittenhouse before the evening hours of the 25th, has never spoken to him or known him after. And yet the state wants you to believe he made up something about a threat to kill. Why? What's in it for him? The threat. If I get either of you alone, I will kill you. That is a threat with a statement and a promise. And lo and behold, the chance presented itself to Mr. Mr. Rosenbaum, and he attempted to execute it. And I don't for a minute believe that he would have done it if it was Mr. Balch, who's much bigger than my client, muscular, well-built, and much more assertive and forceful. Rosenbaum, like any, as he referred to him, I don't even know what he called him, a rag doll, whatever, but the little guy who gets beat up likes to go after the next littlest guy. He saw Kyle alone, and that's what he chose to. Or he could have been mistaken and thinking it was the other person at the ultimate that he went after and had to be held back. They were dressed very similarly, baseball caps, mask. And the only difference was the difference between shorts and a long pants. I can't answer that. Mr. Rosenbaum at this point, I guess, can't either. But you see Mr. Rosenbaum right around the time in question at that location menacing with his chain. I skipped. That's Mr. Balch. I talked about him going on. Ms. Raz, Amber Rasmussen, she was the DA, uh, DNA expert. What I say to the, you is DNA is an incredibly useful tool, but DNA is only as useful as what you put into it. And if DNA shows anything, it shows that it's not proof positive in this case. We know in hearing from Dr. Kelly that he most probably touched the gun. It was a contact wound is the way he described it. And we know through the videos Huber touched the gun with his bare hand and yet no DNA was found on that gun. So don't let your eyes deceive you. Don't let the physical evidence 
be discounted because of what she said. The end of that barrel was not swabbed. And we know, we know he had to be at the end of the barrel or it would have had the soot on all of the fingers. Jason Lakowski thought was an interesting witness. He was the Marine who put the phrase, shout, shove, show, shoot. And I asked him about that and I don't for a minute disbelieve that that's the Marines rule. Is there any retreat in there? He said, no, he looked at me like I was stupid. The reason he looked like that was because they don't retreat. Yet Kyle Rittenhouse did retreat. He tried getting away from Mr. Rosenbaum. He described Joseph Rosenbaum as belligerent with malintent, used the N-word, did the false step thing, did not see Kyle as aggressive. He was there for a shorter period of time than anyone else at Car Source. He also cleared Gage Grossquist's gun after the shooting and made it safe, took the shell out of it. And I ask you to think back to the direct examination of Mr. Lakowski by the state. When they asked him, what did Kyle say to you? His first statement was, I just shot somebody, I need help. That's what he testified to. And then Mr. Binger shows him the statement and gets him to say, well, I told the FBI that. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what he told the FBI. The FBI doesn't let him see that statement, doesn't let him read the statement and say, you've read this to me, it's true and a correct copy. They write down what they think they heard. I ask you to think about what he said. If he didn't shoot somebody, why does he need help? That makes no sense. He said it, he testified to it, that's what happened. The state confronted him and pushes him back to his original statement so he doesn't get in trouble. He put the tourniquet on Gage Grossquitz. He testified that he had his AR-15 with him, providing medical services, first aid, just like Kyle Rittenhouse. And I find it so ironic that he was there. Gage Grosquitz had said to them, go home, we have our own medics, you stooges. And who ultimately helps him with his tourniquet? Sarah Hughes, her testimony, she reminded Mr. Huber and his girlfriend they needed to be home by curfew. Obviously, not advice that was followed. Wish it had been. Carrie Ann Swart, I talked about. She talked about Joseph Rosenbaum,ing Joseph Rosenbaum, being bipolar, being prescribed gabapentin. He had to leave her house that night after walking four miles, taking about an hour, and then walking another four miles back to downtown where the riots were going on, where he could involve himself fully. Her story contradicts Nathan DeBruin. I just got out when he said, I just got out of jail and I'm not afraid to go back. He'd been off his meds for the week prior. The videos of Joseph Rosenbaum show the state that he was in. No proof that he ever took his meds. Saul, Saul Kindiri, he was the first of the Kindiri brothers to testify, car source. He's in the picture with all the people who protected his property. He's there and he said he just liked the military garb. Why did he get a picture then with just one of them? How did he wrangle all these people up? Everybody in that picture said that they wanted him there, they gave him permission, even Dominic Black concurred in that, the state's witness. But as I said earlier, they want these two guys to dirty Kyle up. He's just picking a spot to pick trouble and to be there and cause problems. He was asked to provide security. He did. 
They deny that they were going to pay any money, yet Nick Smith says they were and going to pay money to Nick Smith. And ladies and gentlemen, do you get the feeling that they're a little afraid of being sued, as everybody else in this case is? I think so. And when they were up there, I don't remember them saying, oh, you can protect car source two or car doctor, but don't go to car three. They had somebody arranged to protect car three, car source three, and the word came in that they had left. Dominic, Balch, Joanne Fielder, all of them say they had permission. Why would they lie about that? How does that protect them? They're not charged with anything. Who's the people who are lying here? Sal and Sam. Next, police officer Widener. He was the ET. He went and recovered some of the two, two, three rounds from car source. I believe he found three of them. The other two were found three days later. He photographed a mask. He didn't find the bag. And we do not concede that there was nothing in that bag, not for a minute. They have the burden of proof. They have the burden to pres preserve a crime scene appropriately, get the evidence, and show it to you. Ryan Balch said he smelled ammonia and bleach. They didn't find the fire extinguisher. We know that the fire extinguisher was there. It's in the videos. But that doesn't fit in the state's narrative of Kyle actually going there to put out a fire, which had been started earlier in the Duramax. Officer Van Wee recovered the last two shell casings. Strike that. I love technology. There. Officer Van Wee. Officer Moretti. He was the driver of the squad car that Kyle tried to surrender himself to. He said it was a war zone. It was a war zone those three nights. He described it as the city on fire. The police felt as though they were completely surrounded. Described the constant gunfire that evening. Mr. Binger wants to slough it off as fireworks this. It really wasn't that bad that night. Ladies and gentlemen, it was hell in this area downtown. There were violent people causing trouble. And the state wants us to believe it was okay. The police pushed them back. Now they could leave. Car source was safe. And I can't remember specifically what witness it was, but it stuck out in my mind. The witness said the police pushed them back, let them back, pushed them back, let them back. And a lot of the burning happened late at night, that witness said. Gage Girl Squits. Ten million reasons to change his statement. His attorney is sitting in the courtroom, has been sitting in the courtroom when he testified. If he's just your average complaining witness, why get a lawyer? What do you got to hide? He didn't have a valid concealed carry permit. He wasn't charged. He lies to the police about being armed that night. He said he dropped his gun going down the street. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what's called obstructing. Most people, when you lie to the cops, especially in a murder investigation, you get in a little bit of trouble. I've represented some of those people. Not Mr. Grosquitz, because he's their star witness. But paid for and protected. You don't want us to search your phone? Oh, we're going to invoke the never heard before Marcy's Law exception to the search warrant, even though they had a signed search warrant by a judge of Kenosha County. He was also an armed medic. Wants you to believe that he didn't have one in the chamber and he would never shoot somebody. But before he said that, he said, key, wallet, phone, gun. Never leaves the home without him. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't carry a concealed weapon. And I don't think I could shoot somebody. But when people carry guns, 
That's what they're for in the city. This isn't the wild, wild west. He had his gun. Kyle Rittenhouse had run by him. You'll see the picture. Was by him, gone. Did he go to give medical help? He didn't know that Mr. Rosenbaum was being tended to. No, he decided to run in and advance on the fray. He, the member, not member, excuse me, affiliated with the American People's Revolution here in Wisconsin. And I might have that one word wrong, but he did it. And who ultimately put the tourniquet and fixed it on his arm? But Mr. Lakowski, a member of somebody he refers to as the militia and the stooges. Two different encounters between Gage Grosquitz and my client. The first one, he does not show or give any indication of a weapon. My client does not point a weapon at him, does not shoot at him, does not swipe the weapon towards him. He states he's going to the police. That is uncontradicted. Why doesn't Mr. Grosquitz let him be and go give aid and comfort to his fellow rioter? But instead, he joins the mob, chasing Kyle, arms himself, and runs in the fifth or sixth person into the melee in scene two. And when his friend was called, his friend said in his Facebook post, his only regret was not emptying the clip in to the kid. So we know what his intent was. We know what he wanted to do. Kyle shot first as he was coming in. And he's ta Mr. Binger talks about, oh, he was going to grab the gun. Ladies and gentlemen, left hand, phone. How's he going to grab a gun with a hand filled with a phone? Right hand, gun. He goes back, loads up, and is advancing. That's when Kyle shoots him. He didn't shoot him when he put his hands up. And if that was it, no intent to harm him, all he does, like everybody else, is back up. And nobody else gets shot. But Mr. Grosquitz decides he's going to shoot my client. Unfortunately, my client shot him first. If he had retreated, it's over. And when he's got his hand up like this, as I said earlier, the hands are up. It's not gripping the gun. It's loose. But when he goes in like this, the pistol grip is tight. Heather Williams, crime lab. She testified that the gun works. I have no dispute regarding that. Detective Krieger, he was in the passenger seat of Moretti's car. Pepper sprayed, did not get his ID, didn't ask him about the gun, just told him to go home. Kristen Harris, Rundown Live, stated the video. We showed the video to start this, clearly depicting Mr. Rosenbaum standing there at Car Source 2 shortly after the dumpster, standing there with his chain the shirt tied up over his head, but Mr. Bigger says it's impossible for him to have threatened my client. That's garbage, just like his case. And Mr. Bigger makes so much out of him one time saying, stay on your property. My client has as much right to go anywhere in downtown Kenosha as anyone else, just as the rioters did. And as he walks out to see if anybody wants medical help, he's not doing anything wrong. He's not doing anything to provoke anybody. Detective Antaramian, the juxtaposition of him and Howard, as I said, he is the one who talks about what he sees in the video, totally different. As you see, why did Mr. Rosenbaum go behind that car, two cars over from the Zeminskis? What was he doing over there? 
why was he doing o over there, and why does he come out as soon as Kyle comes down the road? Because they were going to ambush him. They had set it up, and I'll show you the video. James Armstrong. The only thing I can say about James Armstrong is, okay, that's interesting, but what I'd like to say about his photographs, his knowledge of what he did, and some of the statements that the state has made regarding it is, what he did for those 20 hours is hocus pocus, and he makes an exhibit that is out of focus. And that's what the state is relying. The, the picture does not make sense. As I showed earlier, it has Kyle shouldering the gun in the left shoulder. If he has it in the left shoulder, his back would be to the drone. The drone is moving around and that changes the focal point. He's right-handed, that's where it goes. You'd see the crosses across his chest. But no, they need him to have somehow pointed a gun at the Zeminskis. I don't for a minute concede he did, but we know that Mr. Zeminski has been armed all evening. How would pointing a gun at Mr. Zeminski provoke Joseph Rosenbaum, who, according to the state, earlier in the case, they didn't even know each other? But I think they had to run away from that because there's so many pictures of them together. Mr. Armstrong's photograph, testimony, it took three days and 20 hours worth of work to come up with that picture. It went from color to black and white, and he admitted he never compared it to the original photograph, mm -hmm. still shot didn't take into consideration the fact that the drone was moving. The word peer reviewed, state has said. Peer reviewed is an independent verification of the events, the exhibit. So there was no testimony to this because it didn't happen that Mr. Armstrong's coworker did 20 hours on the same photograph and came up with the same result. It didn't happen. When you see, and I'll show it to you later, when you see in the video the mirror and the shininess of the mirror, that's what that is. And by going around, spending 20 hours and bringing things up, it doesn't account for Kyle's arm, it doesn't account for the heat signature of the gun, none of it. Dr. Kelly. Personally, my favorite witness, because physical evidence doesn't lie. The soot, extremely close, if not touching. The location of the soot, I had him circle it on the exhibit. On redirect, after I had him do the demonstration and draw on the photograph, the straight tried to get him to back up his opinion, and back it off. He wouldn't because the physical evidence doesn't lie. It's, as they say in the business, an inconvenient truth. They can't change it. It is what it is. That's the demonstration that happened in front of you, the gun and the hand. And if the individual's coming straight at it, the barrel of the gun, it would go through the hand like this. But we know that it was coming from right here, going down, and came out with a very clean exit wound. No soot here at all. So we know that the gun can't be here. We know there's just a little bit of soot 
on what's commonly referred to as the ring finger, right here, and the bulk of it goes this way because it was over the gun, touching the gun. And <laughs> Mr. Bigger says he was swiping at the gun. Ladies and gentlemen, he didn't need to chase him, didn't need to keep chasing him, didn't need to lunge at him, didn't need to swipe at the gun, i.e. grab the gun. And the shot to the back, as I said, four shots in three quarters of a second. He's backing up, trying to stay away from him, shooting, and he shoots until the threat is immobilized. Ladies and gentlemen, other people in this community have shot somebody seven times, and it's been found to be okay. And my client did it three times in three quarters of a second to protect his life from Mr. Rosenbaum. I'm sorry, but that's what happened. And this is the prosecutor who said he shot him in the back. He shot him in the back on a horizontal plane consistent with lunging. The shot goes in here and ended up in his lower hip across the back. If he's on the ground or down and shot, the bullet goes into the back and ends up in the stomach or on the other side. It cleared back here, ended up in the lower hip. That's because he was on a horizontal plane when Kyle shot him. He had stippling to the stomach from the first. The pants stopped it from lower, but it was still on the upper. The furthest he was away when the first shot was fired was four feet and closing. Four feet. I think it was Mr. Kraus and I who had to fight about how far four feet is. It's not that far. It's not that far at all. Brought a tape measure so I could measure a gun barrel for you today, but that's no longer an issue. So I'll show you what four feet is. No doubts. From the edge of the jury box to my foot right here, four feet, lunge grabbing the gun. Think how close that is. Think how fast that distance is closed. What was Joseph Rosenbaum doing? Was he running after my client to give him a key to the city of Kenosha? Was he running after my client to say, hey, thanks for providing security? Use your common sense and your judgment. Look at Mr. Rosenbaum's behavior throughout the night. As I showed you, these are the pictures. One last one. Get you some pointer. Exhibit 105, Dr. Kelly. So, right here. Here's entry. The exit's right over here. Goes across, clean came out right there. This right here, nothing. Nothing on the back part of the hand, no soot. We know it was over the barrel. Remember Mr. Kraus asking the doctor, well, what about that big puff of smoke? That wouldn't have an effect. Soot only goes so far. That was Dr. Kelly's testimony. He doesn't have a dog in the fight. He looks at the bodies, says what they are, makes a determination, and looks at the evidence. We had an expert, didn't call him because Dr. Kelly told the truth. Couldn't agree more. Ladies and gentlemen, facts and truth matter. In most trials, the case would have ended with Dr. Kelly. But we wanted to bring you our side of the story we had nothing to hide. We were going to put on a defense. I heard Mr. Bigger say red herring. The red herrings in this case are by the state, talking about super bullets, this metal jacket. I've been involved in homicide cases. One time it's a metal jacket. 
The next time the problem is the person had hollow points. Hollow points are designed to kill. Full metal jackets are to go through people. Ladies and gentlemen, bullets are bullets. Hate to tell you, at close range and close contact, they wreak havoc on a body and they kill people. No dispute. Wants to keep pointing at the militia, the militia, the militia. He knows Kyle's not a member of the militia. He has no evidence that he is. They went to the websites. They went to TikTok. They went all of that. All they can do is put up a little thing of a 17-year-old kid from his TikTok trying to be famous. Kyle shot Joseph Rosenbaum to stop a threat to his person. And I'm glad he shot him because if Joseph Rosenbaum had got that gun, I don't for a minute believe he wouldn't have used it against somebody else. He was irrational and crazy. Talked about active shooter, the power of those words. My client didn't shoot at anyone until he was chased and cornered. Nick Smith, got a phone call from Sam, asked on the second night of rioting to go down there. They used the power washer and buckets to try and put out cars. He did that out of the goodness of his heart. Sam asked him to come and protect the next night and be paid, and he agreed to do it. He asked some of his friends to come with the help. Kyle, Dominic Black, talked about another father and a son, and then the people from West Bend showed up. He said that when they first saw Sam on the 25th, Sam gave him a hug and thanked him for protecting his property. He was on the roof when it was chemical bomb. He knew that Sam was grateful for their presence, but he also knew that people on the ground needed weapons. He heard Kyle when Kyle came back saying, I had to shoot. Body armor. I don't know why the Grays Lake Cadet Program gives people body armor. Don't know. My client had it. And if he wanted to be an active shooter, as Mr. Binger wants to portray him, why would he give up his body armor? Nick Smith wanted body armor. He goes, here, Nick, use mine. I'm going to be doing medical. Helping other people. You see him do it throughout. He gave Nick his body armor. Why would somebody give up their body armor if they're going to go out looking for trouble, seeking confrontation? doesn't make sense. Joanne Fielder, she described Joseph Rosenbaum wearing a red shirt with a green earring. She described yellow pants, who I'll get to later. She stated Joseph Rosenbaum yelled he was going to kill us MFers and cut their hearts out. JR's arm goes up. And with a second, within seconds, they're tearing up from a gas bomb. She couldn't say for sure that she saw him throw it, but obviously that's the circumstantial evidence in her belief. She never saw Kyle act inappropriately with anybody, point a weapon at anybody. The size of the weapon might change, but it doesn't change what it can do. Presence speaks volume. It's a deterrent. And they've been pelted all night long with rocks. She was aware that they had consent to be where they are. Nathan DeBruin. Interesting witness. He was out there taking photographs on the nights in question, more importantly the 25th. He filmed the destruction of this community, uptown, downtown. And the ATF and the FBI found out about his videos, his still photography, which I think was incredible. They wanted it. And what did he do? Didn't ask for money. He gave it to him. He sat down with the detective and gave a full interview, showed him the photographs, talked about Mr. Rosenbaum and all the problems he was causing that night the things he was doing, and that's within less than a month after this. 
He'd never met Kyle Rittenhouse, didn't know Kyle Rittenhouse, but he had a feeling about what happened that night, and he said if there was trouble, Mr. Rosenbaum was there. I don't think any truer words have ever been repeated. Did he have a lawyer when he met with Detective Howard? No, he didn't. When did he get a lawyer? Remember, after he met with Mr. Kraus and Mr. Binger. Mr. Binger, the person who has made it his personal goal of putting my client's head on his wall. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what it did. And it means he's been cutting corners. And Nathan DeBruyne said, after meeting with Mr. Binger, I was very uncomfortable. He tried to put words in my mouth. And he had to go and hire a lawyer to protect him. First it was show him the videos and then ask him the questions, trying to put words in his mouth. He didn't want that to happen. He wanted to be able to tell his story of what he knew, what he did. He talked about Zeminski, the photographs of all the conduct that Zeminski had done that night, and I'll show you some of them. The photos have a time stamp on them. And he related to Detective Howard in September of 2020 about Joseph Rosenbaum yelling, I just got out of jail and I'm not afraid to go back. Those are his words that he heard Mr. Rosenbaum. It was not objected to by the state and there's been no proof that he wasn't in a jail. They want you to believe he was in a hospital. There's no medical records he was in a hospital. There's no medical records he was properly medicated. And I submit to you that in this case, the way he was behaving, I don't think he was properly medicated. There's pictures of him with the trailer fires, the chains, starting numerous dumpster fires. I submit that he was with the Zeminskis on many of the occasions, and he was emboldened by Mr. Zeminski because Mr. Zeminski was always brandishing his firearm. We saw Joseph Rosenbaum taking the chains. He chose to come down and riot, and that's what he did. Nathan DeBruyne chronicled that. Why did he chronicle it? Because it's, no, it, it, it's not very interesting if you take a picture of a protester who's just standing there, but Mr. Rosenbaum was involved in all these different things, and I'll show you those pictures. Lucas Zanin, Kenosha County resident. Every now and again, he goes down to Texas in the winter. Testified, born and raised, he stated he had empathy for the small businesses of Kenosha, did not want them looted, did not want them burned. Is that somehow to be called into question? Does any of us want those fires started and to come and burn? I don't think so. He authenticated the video that was taken from his car as accurate showing the south side of car source three. And you watch that video and you see people destroying someone else's property. During the video, you look at the one wall, there's nothing there, you see somebody spray painting on it and they've written the word loot on it. You see another individual going in the hood of the car trying to do something it's not his car. He's not some roadside mechanic. They're destroying property. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Binger and I will go round and round about it until the cows come home. They were rioters. They weren't demonstrators. Were the demonstrators down by the courthouse earlier in the night? Yes, there were people doing a legitimate demonstration. These people were rioting. And you see in his tape, they're hitting the cars with pipes. You hear the glass breaking. You see the people jumping on it. And the important part of it, and I'll show it to you, is you hear the first bang, which is Mr. Zeminski's shot. Two seconds later, you see, you hear the next shot, and then you see the exodus of all the people taking off from that. 
that's why Kyle couldn't run and continue to run for Mr. Rosenbaum, which he was under no legal duty to do whatsoever. Jacob Marshall referred to himself as Gage Grosquitz's best friend. We brought Mr. Grosquitz's best friend in as a witness because he had posted something on Facebook immediately after this. He testified he couldn't find Gage Grosquitz because he was under an anonymous name at the hospital. Nobody knew who Gage Grosquitz was, who Jacob Marshall was. But he takes it upon himself to post a Facebook message talking about how... Could I have the next slide, please? I just talked to Gage. To his only regret was not killing the kid and hesitating to pull the gun before emptying the entire mag on Coward. Here's a picture of them hugging each other at the hospital. And this is posted. Ladies and gentlemen, why does somebody post something like that? Because that's what his friend told him. And he wanted to get Gage Grosquitz's word out. He didn't repost and say, I lied. He took it down to try and hide it. But unfortunately, the inter internet has a memory. Next witness was Kyle Rittenhouse. I've done with the Kandiri brothers. We did recall them, but I talked about that. Kyle Rittenhouse did not have to take the witness stand to tell his story was told through video. He wanted you as the jurors to hear his personal experience of the night of the 25th. He knew Mr. Binger would cross-examine him for hours, and he was willing to get up on that witness stand, take the oath, and tell his story the best way he could. And he did. Could Mr. Binger pick on him and find little things about it? A little bit. Did he damage his credibility? I don't think so. Getting to Mr. Yellow Pants, which he's been talked about. Mr. Binger talks about, he says with sarcasm. Ladies and gentlemen, you've seen the video. But remember that when Yellow Pants said to Kyle, he goes, you held your gun like this. That's low ready. That's not like this. It's down. He never pointed his gun at him. Did he have a gun? Yes. Did he tell him to get off a car? Yeah. But when he said it to Kyle, Kyle said, I did, and walked away, not wanting confrontation. And remember Richie McGinnis' testimony about that. There was the individual with the slingshot. There was the individual with two rocks in his hand, and the other individual with the gun. And when Mr. McGinnis walked up to him, he immediately had to put his hand down because they were the one advanced on him, and he bought him off with a white claw. My client, when this happened, was 17 years old. His actions are to be judged as a 17-year-old, not by Mr. Bigger's standards, but by that of a 17-year-old. And Mr. McGinnis said he didn't appreciate the way people looked at him. And maybe he didn't. And I think the best evidence of that is when Mr. Rosenbaum begins chasing him, you hear on the tape, he yells, friendly, 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 three times. He thinks that if he just says the magic words, they'll stop. They don't. They could have, Mr. Rosenbaum could have looked at it and said, hey, you're not trying to harm anybody. I'll leave you alone. Is that what happened? No. Um, made a fatal mistake. That day, chasing Kyle Rittenhouse into the corner, he ran as far as he could, and he shot four times in three quarters of a second. 
Mr. Binger makes so much of Kyle's residence. Antioch, Illinois, I think most people here know where it is. It's not a foreign country. Antioch, Illinois, right across the border. He worked in Kenosha. His dad lived in Kenosha. His grandmother lived in Kenosha. He worked in Pleasant Prairie. His best friend, Dominic Black, lived in downtown Kenosha. They want you to believe that there's some sinister thing about that. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a very mobile world. I'm from the foreign country of Racine, Wisconsin, 13 miles away, a little bit further. I'm on the north side. Ladies and gentlemen, when Kenosha burned, people who like Kenosha, they hurt. I remember 34 years ago walking into this courtroom, first time I ever appeared as a lawyer, back in that conference room. And when I saw what happened in Kenosha, it bothered me. Those three days. People can protest, but people can't indiscriminately burn property for no reason of innocent people. How does that further anyone's cause? Kyle feels for this community. He worked as a lifeguard. When he came down here, are we to believe that he's working to clean up graffiti, not getting paid because he's here to look for trouble? Is this all some master plan? That's ridiculous. He came down here trying to help to see the damage, and that's what he did. Next. Dr. John Black, his testimony about the slides, making times, and I'll go over some of those. Um, but specifically, as I, test, not, as I argued earlier, the zero shot from, I should say it this way, friendly, friendly, three times, to the first shot, 10 point some seconds. There's a change in elevation in the video. As he's lunging forward, the shot rings out after that. The zero shot, which is shot one, then two 26 hundredths, the next one 24, 23, for a total of .739. He gets up, he comes around the car, because all the individuals had left, after hearing the shots, goes to check. And to believe that he could stay there is preposterous. All I said would have happened Scene two would have been moved to scene one. You heard the one individual yell, get the F out of here. Minsky's walking around with his gun over his head, pointing at Kyle, and I'll show you that in a little bit. In the exhibits that Dr. Black showed the jury, no color was added. No color was subtracted. The videos didn't go from color to black and white. There was no structural problems. He demonstrated his technique regarding changing brightness and contrast right in front of you. And the one video went from a dark mess of nothing, moved the two lines, I don't know how to do it, but he did right in front of you, hit it, and all of a sudden it's light and you can see it. The whole event that evening took two minutes and 55 seconds from the three times friendly to the time he surrendered or attempted to surrender at law enforcement. Officer Brittany Bray, let me go through the, back up to the first one. Total time, two minutes, 55 seconds, according to Dr. Black. Next, friendly, friendly, the four shots, 10.8 seconds. Those are the shot times. Remember the sound he put and synced up with the video? That was the audio graph, the green thing he showed you. You can see when the shot is fired, he matches it up, times them out by the frames per second. You come up with those numbers. And that's because when you show something in slow motion, it looks like somebody can really have the time to think, process, and do all that. You have to remember how fast all this was happening in event number one. He's running. 
the bag, he turns, addresses, keeps running, and makes a decision, a life and death decision, that he has to turn around and address the threat of Mr. Rosenbaum. At that point, Kyle has stopped. Mr. Rosenbaum, like those other people in event number two, could have put up his hands and just backed up, made a bad decision, shouldn't have done it. No, he goes diving for him. Have it beginning when he's hitting the head with the rock and ending with the fourth shot, taking 14.9 14 .9 seconds. Next, police officer Brittany Bray measured the gun, the pullback, the slide, four inches, brought the ruler out, because you never see, in event number two, Kyle pull back the four inches, slow motion or otherwise. There were no unfired bullets at the scene for the AR. There was the unfired bullet by the clip and the Glock that had been cleared from Jason Lakowski. Drew Hernandez, Mr. Binger, for some reason, didn't like Drew Hernandez. You could hear it in his questioning. Ladies and gentlemen, Drew Hernandez had a point of view. There's no doubt about it. But what was that point of view? He's a citizen journalist, and he's covering the riots. And he didn't think that the mass media was covering the riots correctly. They were just calling everybody demonstrators and not covering the devastation and the destruction that was being done. That's his point of view. It's kind of my point of view, too. Um, but does that mean that his video's lying? Does that mean when he says, I saw him lunge, that he's lying? He doesn't have a dog in this fight. He tried to get all of his video to the state. The drop box wasn't big enough. He sees that the case is going to trial. He reaches out, gets a lawyer, and provides it simultaneously to both of us, and we end up playing it. He describes the Zeminskis, Joseph Rosenbaum starting fires in the dumpster, the yelling, he sees Kyle, the yelling of the word, the N-word. He sees Kyle walking around yelling medical, medical, right up until the last time when event number one starts. He was standing right at the corner, had a clear view to the first incident. He described him as charging from behind. He saw Joseph Rosen throw the bag. He described hearing a shot from behind Kyle, which we all know is the Zeminski shot, the man who's never been brought before you people. And he saw Joseph Rosenbaum lunge. Ladies and gentlemen, you sat through almost 10 days of testimony. You've heard the openings, most of the closings, and I have yet to hear Mr. Binger explain why Joseph Rosenbaum had the right to chase my client. To me, if I didn't know better, I would think he's a whiny defense lawyer. Everybody's out to get me. Everybody's lying. I'm the one who's bringing forth the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, the videos show the truth. The videos show the actions of Joseph Rosenbaum. Balch is lying. Fiedler's lying. Lakowski's lying. Richie is lying. Dale, he's really lying because he's imputing my character. Dale, De Nathan De Bruyne, excuse me. Hernandez, he's lying because he's a right-wing journalist. All six of them are lying. And then I forgot. Detective Howard, he's lying too because he could see through the videos. He could see that Rosenbaum came out from hiding behind the car. My client passed through a max. Rush to judgment, as I said earlier, you bet. Highly charged atmosphere here in Kenosha, make no mistake, you live here, you know. They had to do something. They had to charge the white supremacist. 
who isn't a white supremacist. They've never reassessed their case. They've never looked at it. They've never said, oh, Dr. Kelly, let's talk about this wound on the hand. What? That means he was touching the barrel or his hand was over the barrel when it was fired? Well, that means he was pretty close. No, we're not going to reassess. We're going to march forward. We're going to throw it into the hands of 12 people from the city and let them do our work. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a political case. We can take politics out of it as in Democrat and Republican. The district attorney's office is marching forward with this case because they need somebody to be responsible. They need somebody to put and say, we did it. He's the person who brought terror to Kenosha. Kyle Rittenhouse is not that individual. The rioters, demonstrators who turned into rioters, those are the individuals who bring us forth. And I have to remember, and I'll show you the videos for the last time, the anger and the mob that was going on that night. They were not going to be dissuaded from doing things. They were pushing, firing dumpsters, destroying property. And that was, they're saying Mr. Rittenhouse put out a fire. Yes, it was a small fire. Last time I checked, small fires turn into big fires. So, kind of stupid. Armstrong, focus, focus, out of focus. I've talked about him. He spent 20 hours reworking a frame in a video and averaging, having my clients miraculously go from a right-handed shooter to a left-handed shooter. The mirror on the truck is the arm. Their whole case relies on that one photograph that he spent 20 hours. That's how they're going to set proof provocation. A word you never heard in the opening statement. It was my client chased him down and shot him in the back. Oops, can't prove that. This is the day before car source burning, car source one burning the ground. What's in the foreground? The trailer should be the subject. Pictures later on. There's Kyle earlier in the day on the 25th setting up his alibi, setting up his I'm a good person story because he thinks he's going to go out and kill three people that night. Ladies and gentlemen, that is garbage. How would he know he's going to be photographed? And what does that do? It just shows he's interested in trying to do good. The picture, Mr. Kandiri at Car Source 3. The state doesn't want Kyle to go to Car Source 3. According to the state, he has to stay at Car Source 2, 59th and Sheridan. Yet, Nick Smith called and asked him to go there because whoever was going to protect that property had left. I'm going to object, Your Honor, the record does not indicate that Nick Smith made that phone call. Uh, it's argument. Uh, folks, you heard the evidence and uh, use your collective recollections uh, to determine what the truth of it is and discount anything that is not supported in the evidence. Testimony was he received a phone call saying they were destroying cars at Car Source 3 and he went down there. First, Kyle asked for a fire extinguisher, asked the other individual to go down there with him. He said, didn't give an answer, and Kyle took off going down there to try and help protect that property. This is that night, the tear gas, the fires. Here is Mr. Rosenbaum pushing one of many dumpsters. Dumpster fires. Right there, that's one. Another one. Stop. Bats, guns. Mr. Rosenbaum pushing it in. Either the gas station or Mr. Hernandez. <coughs> the police vehicle right down here. 
They're trying to push it to a... I can't hear him. I apologize. They're trying to push the dumpster down to the line of police or to the gas station. It's put out and the reaction from Mr. Rosenbaum of dumpster number two. There's Mr. Rosenbaum arguing. Mr. Zeminski, the smiling puppeteer standing behind him. Yeah, they didn't know each other. Maybe they didn't, but they sure spent a lot of time together that night. Mr. Zeminski with the yellow circle, holding his firearm, yellow pants. Kelly Zeminski with a flashlight in her hand. Last time I checked, there wasn't any lighting problems. The flashlight is a weapon to bash heads if you have to. Many people with AR-15s, not one person with an AR-15. That's the difference between this, the ultimate gas station, Krakus, and what happened down at Car Source 3. Kyle Rittenhouse was alone. He had been taken away from the herd, and Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Zeminski were going to get Mr. Rosenbaum and his bag. He's not dissuaded by the people. He's going right at them. He's not afraid of them. He's pushing in and going at them. He's not afraid of a gun. Yelling. Shoot me, N-word. Shoot me, N-word. Mr. Zeminski holding his gun down to his side, remembering this is a Black Lives Matter rally, and he's there to support their cause. Yeah. Mr. Huber, right there, holding him back, actually physically holding him back, but right in the middle of it. Look at the anger in his face. This here, I'll start it, but I'm going to point it out first. We saw a video earlier, this individual starting the drum axe on fire, right here, jump kick man. You see him shoot in the lighter fluid or flammable liquid. You see John Pickman being right involved. This is the calm Tuesday evening that Mr. Binger is alluding to. Mr. Rosenbaum, this time wearing a blue mask tipping over the porta potty. It was just a little porta potty. The trailer. The trailer's important because it's the way he arms himself with the chain. Here's Rosenbaum pushing it. If he's just a regular demonstrator or misunderstood a little bit upset, what does he need a chain for? What does he need a bag? Why didn't he leave it with Ms. Swart? Here, three things. The blue circle, his bag, backed up by the fire. Look at that bag. Does that look like there's nothing in it? Look at this. What is that? That's not a water bottle, ladies and gentlemen. I can't tell you what it is, but it's not a water bottle. Look at this. 
two feet of chain on each side. He's got it. Take it and sure from right here. The toe chain. Jump kick man. Right there, the mask, the white jeans, the black. Look at the boots. Those boots would soon be impacting my client's face. Rundown live here once again. Rosenbaum, Zeminski at the trailer after it's been taken down the street, set up on its side, and started on fire. You can still see one of the chains hanging from the tongue of the trailer. Rundown live. The state showed this video. I started my opening statement with it. I was going to show you where Mr. Rosenbaum is. I've already done it. Don't need to waste your time. How do I get to the end? Oh. Here's the picture that we showed at the beginning. Right there, the 125-26. Mr. Rosenbaum masked with his chain during the Rundown Live video. Mr. Rosenbaum with the chain. So I said earlier, look at how Kyle's dressed. Look at the pack on his left side, left hip. The crosses going across the front and the back of his chest. Nowhere in the magic picture is that depicted. 1140, he's crossed over that line asking people if they want medical runs into yellow pants, he walks away from confrontation. And yellow pants said, you pointed your gun at me, and he goes like this, low ready. The individuals who were there with him, slingshot, rocks in the hand, gun. Mr. McGinnis. Kyle, after having the brief thing with yellow pants, he goes away from them, goes over, looks for Mr. Balch. They might have been close to one another, but they did not find one another. He tries to go back. Wants to get back to car source two. After that, he goes back and waits. He gets the phone call. He testified about the phone call, either from Nick or Dominic. And what does he do? He gets a fire extinguisher. He hasn't had a fire extinguisher all night, but he gets a fire extinguisher. The circumstantial evidence shows the call came through. He testified the call came through. You know, if it wasn't in his phone, the state would have brought it up. But now they're playing games once again. This is Drew Hernandez's video. It starts in color and goes, excuse me, starts in black and white and goes to color. You have Jump Kick Man, the Zeminskis, and you'll hear Kelly Zeminski talking. And during the first part of the trial, we saw this trailer go by and it cut off the view from this location. And I'll stop it a few times and hear that? Talking about a pepper ball exploding in her ass. That's Kelly Zeminski speaking. It's blurry. That's Kyle right there to the right of the garbage can by that splurge of light.
Mr. Rosenbaum, as soon as Kyle is coming, gets up and starts walking away. Along with Kelly Zeminski, this individual, the jump kick man was there earlier. Up oh, there. That's Kyle with the fire extinguisher walking. Doesn't say anything to any of them. They see him coming. They head down to do their ambush. He's not chasing them. He's not running after them. He's walking down to put out the fire. Let's start it over again. Hear Kyle yell, friendly, friendly, friendly. That is the start of Mr. Rosenbaum chasing Kyle. So the order, the order. Now they come in. He's thrown, it goes to the small. He's thrown the bag. Duramax just got Duramax. The shine on the Duramax. Kyle comes right into this area before he's chased. That's shown on the drone video. It's shown on the FBI video. Skinskis are standing right here. That's when the chase is on. You can hear the destruction of the vehicles as he approaches. off and running. We've seen the videos. Here is the Zanin video, parts of it. As I said, watch for the first shot. Look at all those people standing there. A wall of people destroying cars. The state wants Kyle to run into that wall of people. Listen for the first shot and watch the lackadaisical attitude, and then hear the four shots in quick succession, and watch what happens. Oh my God. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. The first shot happens, they barely begin to move. Between the first shot and Kyle's first shot, which is the second shot you hear, Kyle has turned around. Why is he turned around? Because that wall of people is there and he has nowhere else to run. The cars, the van, all of the people destroying property, the soda machine, he turns around and Mr. Rosenbaum keeps coming. Mr. Rosenbaum keeps coming, he lunges, gunshots. There's Mr. Zeminski with his gun down there at his side.
pointing the gun once again in his right hand. Gage Gross quits his cell phone video. Does Kyle ever point the firearm at Gage Grosswitz when he runs up on him unarmed? Hey, what are you doing? You shot somebody? I'm going to get the police. He's going towards the police. He's continuing on. He's past Gage Grosswitz. He hasn't shot Gage Grosquitz. He hasn't pointed the firearm at Gage Grosquitz. The medic, if he thinks someone shot, why isn't he there? He doesn't know Richie McGinnis is tending to him. None of the people who chase him are at Car Source 3. There is no evidence. Zeminski doesn't chase him. Zeminski doesn't want anything to do with it. His wife doesn't want anything to do with it. But the mob has now formed and is chasing him down Sheridan Road in a northerly direction. Who shot? Who shot? He turns all the way around, looking towards car source three. Could go there. At this point, he hasn't armed himself. <coughs> Kyle is zero threat to anyone. This active shooter beat. to try and get to the police. Mr. Binger must live in fairy tale land to think that Kyle could stop, put his gun down, and say, hey, everything's good, leave me alone, I'm going to the police. Unfortunately, that's not how the real world works. This was real world. Hey, stop it! People yelling to stop him. Next picture, you saw it in opening statement. Mr. Rosen, excuse me, Mr. Grosswitz chasing down Kyle Rittenhouse. Kept his gun in the small of his back. He's arming himself right here. Look how far Kyle Rittenhouse is ahead of him. No threat. He's run two blocks, almost three, because it's at the far end of 63rd. He hasn't shot his gun since. If he's an active shooter looking to take as many people as possible, he's laying waste to everybody as he was running. Remember, he's got 30 bullets. He shot eight times, four in scene one and four coming up. He's not indiscriminately shooting, pointing, doing anything. Here's full speed. <laughs> Pointing the gun at anyone? No. <laughs> Running down the street, trying to get to those lights where the Bearcats are and law enforcement. He's not running off to the side to hide in the sh Knocking his hat off. What has Kyle Rittenhouse done? Nothing. Trying to get away from the mob. First strike from the mob. He's not an active shooter. He's gone two blocks, hasn't shot anybody. Coming in behind with a skateboard at the ready, Anthony Huber. That will be strike number one. Remember in opening statements when Mr. Binger said, oh, something happened to his skateboard. He took a swing at him. Kyle blocked it with his arm in the enhanced photos. What does Mr. Huber do? He runs, grabs the skateboard, and comes in for more. What are you doing? He's on the ground. Most vulnerable position you can be in. And what do we have? We have Anthony Huber here already picking up his skateboard. For this guy with the towel wrapped around his head, come and get on Kyle. Jump kick, man. The guy just hit him in the head. This individual. 
we go forward just a little bit, see if it works this far. Nope. You saw this individual over here who's now obstructed come in at Kyle. Kyle points his firearm at him. He backs up. Kyle does not shoot. Jump kick man is leading with this foot. His foot is still on the ground. What direction is Kyle pointing right now? Watch what happens after jump kick man kicks him in the face. He's turned around. He's looking in that direction. Anthony Huber coming in with the skateboard. Watch what Anthony Huber does with the skateboard. Blow to the head. Coming in, Kyle's trying to get up. Anthony Huber's hand goes onto the gun. This is the fast one. The gun is pulled away from Kyle. Anthony Huber fires. When Anthony Huber fires, Gage Girl squids. Flinches, <coughs> covers up, Natch, natural, uncontrollable reaction. Get his ass. Now here's the slow motion. He's been hit in the head, the cap is off. Anthony Huber winds up with the full force of his body. From back here, he swings the skateboard at Kyle. Kyle senses it coming, he turns around and looks, blocks it with his arm. Doesn't turn around and shoot Anthony Huber as he's being attacked with what is a deadly weapon. A skateboard can cause death or great bodily harm, ladies and gentlemen. He doesn't do it, he continues to run a couple of steps before the blow to the head and this is knocked into the ground. He immediately ch changes direction goes running for the skateboard. I want to get through this one. Okay, now this is slow motion. Just, as he's on the ground, he's set up, trying to get up. The individual to Kyle's left is the one who runs in. Kyle points the firearm, he backs off. He is not shot at. Backs up. He's now addressing the second nearest threat. Does not shoot. That individual right there in that picture is stopping. Jump kick man launches. Contact, fire. Turned around. In comes Anthony Huber. Blow to the head and neck. Now, I'm going to start it. You'll see Anthony Huber pull on his gun. And you'll see the butt of the gun separate from Kyle's body going in that direction away from him. See the gun being pulled away from him? Shot. Mr. Huber goes down. 
Grow squids, flinches, freezes, stops. <laughs> Hands up, no pull. Mr. Girl Squids is standing like this, and all of a sudden you see him kick his foot back and launch forward. He loads his back foot going forward at Kyle with a loaded Glock handgun. Kyle sees it coming, gets within a couple of feet, he fires. If he's got his hands up and wants nothing to do with Kyle, like everybody else, just back away and you don't get shot. Mr. Grosswitz decides he's going to take him out and his only regret, as stated in the Facebook post, he didn't fire first and empty his clip into the kid. He's hit in the arm. He shot at once, he's backing up. That's the last shot. I went through the quickness of the shots from the rock in the head to that fourth shot. He gets up, you still see this individual armed with a board or a two by four or a fence post, doesn't shoot at him. This person, he doesn't perceive as a danger. His hands are up, doesn't perceive shoot at him. Now as he wheels around, watch what this individual does. That was the end of it. Kyle turns around. He turns. That individual steps away from him. No more shots. Shots from behind him, continues on his way, trying to turn himself into the police. Trying to get to the end of it. People yelling to shoot him. He doesn't stop because it's not safe. Goes with his hands up to law enforcement. Hey, he just shot them! Hey, go right here, just shot them! Go right here, just shot all of them down there! Go right here! Yeah. Continues on. Hands up. You hear the story about the pepper spray. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the case. There was no threatening behavior that started this. Mr. Rosenbaum was hell-bent on causing trouble that night. He did what he did, and he started this. There are tragical, tragic parts of it, but Kyle Rittenhouse's behavior was protected under the law of the state of Wisconsin the law of self-defense. You've heard the instructions, and I'll end with this. You decide on count one. If you decide that his conduct was privileged under the use of self-defense, you don't go on to the lesser included. If it was privileged under self-defense, that affects count two, both of the things that happened in scene one, as I read earlier, page nine of the jury instructions. If his conduct was privileged as to Rosenbaum, it's privileged as to Mr. McGinnis. On to the next ones at scene two. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no evidence whatsoever that he was an active shooter other than Mr. Binger calling him that. And there's no evidence that any of those other individuals who attacked him in the mob that night were attacking an active shooter. He wasn't shooting. And if they want to be the heroes and they want to beat somebody and do what they're going to do to them, they better be right. And they weren't. 
Kyle Rittenhouse shot Mr. Rosenbaum because he was attacking Kyle. Every person who was shot was attacking Kyle. One with a skateboard, one with his hands, one with his feet, one with a gun. Hands and feet can cause great bodily harm. I'm sure the state's gonna get up and say, well, he didn't have great bodily harm, so it doesn't matter. That's not the standard. The standard is could cause great bodily harm. My client does not have to take a beating from the hands of this mob or the hands of Mr. Rosenbaum. And Mr. Rosenbaum might be little, but he is a pretty muscular guy. And some 30 some year old guy can take a 17 year old kid nine times till Tuesday. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a tough choice, but the evidence only leads to one conclusion. That is that Kyle Rittenhouse's conduct on August 25th was privileged based upon the actions of Mr. Rosenbaum and others. There are no winners in this case, but putting Kyle Rittenhouse down for something he was privileged to do will serve no legitimate purpose. I ask you to do this, do justice here under the law of the state of Wisconsin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rich.